In this lecture, we move forward to talk about steps. Steps are one of the most common great change devices to accommodate pedestrians. And similar to walls, we will go through a few design guidelines. Specifically, we'll talk about the width of the stairs, the height to depth ratio, the flight sequence, and the pitch of the tread. So the first guideline, the width of the stairs depends on their intended function. Three feet is really the required minimum for anybody to pass by. At least four feet is necessary for two people to pass at the same time. Second, the riser to tread ratio is critical for safety and walking comfort. So the riser here is the height of the stairs, basically where you trip on, okay? The higher the riser, the more effort to lift your foot to get up the stairs. On the other hand, if it's too low, the stairs will become a tripping hazard. In terms of the tread here, is the depth of the step where you step on okay it needs to be deep enough to fit your entire foot but as it gets larger you will need to make a bigger stride to get onto the next one so there needs to be a balance as well we'll talk about specific dimensions in the next slide So here are some more specific guidelines to facilitate the design of safe and comfortable exterior stairs. Note that these are different from designing indoor stairs because stairs in an outdoor environment feels steeper. Okay, so first the riser and the tread ratio must remain the same for the entire stair sequence. Do not vary their dimensions within one flight because that creates surprises along the way that could get people hurt, okay? Next, there is an appropriate range for both the tread and the riser dimensions. Treads should be between 12 and 18 inches deep. Those less than 12 inches will feel too shallow and steep, and those over 18 inches will require an awkward stride, okay? Note that this refers to stairs designed for people to take consecutive steps, not the ones functioning as sitting areas, for example, like the one in the South Warren in Stuckman Building. Okay. In terms of risers, they should be between 3 inches and 6 inches high. If you are using stairs to accommodate moderate grade transition, three and four inches risers are pretty good and comfortable to walk on. Anything above seven inches high should be avoided. They just feel too steep and cannot be comfortable, okay? And those less than three inches high should also be avoided because they become tripping hazard. Also, a single step in the landscape should be avoided because they are very difficult to notice. They are often called a trip step. And if this situation already exists in the landscape, obvious visual cues should be provided to help people identify the step. Okay, like this picture shows here, colors or other means such as handrails, tactile cues, warning signs, and lighting could be used to help people identify, okay? But note that one step might be okay in some occasions, such as at a gate or onto a deck where material change makes that step more evident. There is a formula that you can use to calculate either your tread or your rise based on the other. So if you have a six inches tall riser, your tread would be 24 
to 16 inches minus that 12 inches, two times of the riser, right? So that will be 12 to 14 inches deep. If you have a five inch tall riser instead, the tread would be 24 to 26 inches minus 10, which equals to 14 to 16 inches deep. And you can see some of the common dimensions of the stairs highlighted in yellow here. One final guideline for the riser is that the last one at the bottom of the stairs cannot flush with the end of the cheek wall if there's any. This basically means that there cannot be a step here flushing with the wall. Because you have to allow space for people to place their feet when they grab onto the handrail, if there's any, right? Even when there's no handrails, when they see the wall, people naturally expect that extra space at the bottom and will likely trip if that space is missing. Okay? Next, about the sequence of the stair flight. When possible, include no less than three risers in a flight of stairs to make them more noticeable. Too many flights with few steps will make people feel more tired, okay? If a flight has more than five risers, you need to consult local regulations and see if handrails are required. They usually are. Do not exceed 12 risers per flight. Again, consult local regulations to confirm the maximum number of risers allowed. It's usually 10 to 12, and we use 12 in our class assignments. Okay, more than 12 risers per flight, you have to break them into multiple flights of stairs, with a landing area in between, as shown in the picture here. Okay? Now, the fourth guideline about the pitch of the tread. So the treads needs to drain as well. Think about the icy winter in State College. If steps don't drain, stepping up and down these stairs can be very scary, right? So typically, a 1% slope is designed to ensure that water runs off, but you can't exceed the maximum allowable slope of 2% in any direction on a step. Okay? Next, let's talk about representing stairs with spots and contours. Again, spots are more important than contours to be included on the construction drawings for stairs. And here we use top of stairs, TS, and bottom of stairs, BS. That should be labeled at the top and bottom of each flight. Okay, so more specifically, TS and BS should not be labeled at each step. You don't need the labeling on these steps in between. Okay, only at the top and the bottom of each flight. You could also label only one TS and one BS in the middle like this example shows here, one BS, one TS in the middle, okay? You don't have to label them at both ends. Additionally, you need to calculate how many risers and treads each flight has and label their quantities and dimensions. So as this example shows, here for this flight of the stairs, we have seven risers at six inches high, okay, and we have six treads at 12 inches deep. So this is the way that you should represent stairs in your exercise. Regarding contours, same as retaining walls, no contours should be drawn on the steps in the plan because that simply adds up confusion, okay? So here is one additional example of how contours run from the landscape 
to the stairs, then around the retaining wall, and then connecting back to the slope on the right. And for the last part of the stairs lecture, I want to quickly run through some pictures that may inspire you to think about design opportunities with stairs. So the first one comes from the Stukman building's backyard, right? The design here tried to integrate a seating space or artwork display area with planters alongside the stairs. So this is an example of how you can make your stair space multifunctional. The next one is very famous, the blue steps, okay, is this is on a very steep slope between a house and his flower garden. Designer was Fletcher Steele, he used a double stairway, double stairway with delicate curved white railings, small landings, and blue painted grottos under the landings. Using the white stamp birches as part of the composition as well. So basically this is man-made structures actually enhancing the natural beauty of the landscape here. Another example here at the Naval Cemetery landscape in Brooklyn the stairs are used to accent the entry here that frame the memorial medals here, right? Think about steps you know, to be integrated with outdoor or a meditation space. And for the last example here at the River Theater along the Chicago River Walk, think about how we can make steps now into a riverfront theater connecting people from different directions, right? 